If you're worried about your health, it is a huge relief to hear a medical professional say, no, don't worry about it, you're completely normal. But I'm going to make a controversial statement. If anyone anywhere ever calls you normal, don't worry. Panic. If you see homelessness and you shrug your shoulders, you're normal, but you're not healthy. If you see forced, stullifying, degrading, and mindless work everywhere and your biggest concern is the unemployment rate, you're normal, but you're not healthy. If you think hard work is a virtue and too much leisure is bad, you're normal, but you're not healthy. If you think it is okay to blame the poor for their suffering, you're normal, but you're not healthy. If you believe that excluding the different, the disabled, and the divergent from the full range of opportunities, you're normal, but you're not healthy. If you believe that the health of the economy is more important than the health of the environment, you're normal, but you're not healthy. If you want to succeed at your job and you don't have time to change the world, you're normal and you're not healthy. Normality should not be reassuring. What you should want to hear is that you're abnormal. You're weird, you're strange, you're delusional. You live in a fantasy. You are unrealistic. That is what true mental health is, and that is the idea I'm preaching in today's video. The ideas in this video have been inspired by the book Normality Does Not Equal Mental Health, The Need to Look Elsewhere for Standards of Good Psychological Health, written by Stephen James Bartlett and published in 2011. But I'm appropriating his ideas and using them in a way he would not approve. Disclaimer. I need to make something clear. I am not suggesting that we should stop treating mental disturbances as disorders or diseases. I'm pointing out that mental health science is in an early period of development compared to other physical health sciences. This stage of development opens up more room for interpretation of the science. I am not arguing that any specific diagnosis is incorrect, rather that it is a good bet that some are. I am not dispensing medical advice. Whether or not a diagnosis is accurate does not mean that the treatments are ineffective. Drugs are tested to show some efficacy and some level of safety in order to be an acceptable treatment. Other types of treatment, like therapy, usually and hopefully, has also been documented as effective. If you are being treated for mental health conditions under the supervision of a professional, then please, please continue. Professional mental health practitioners have undergone significant education, training, and have experiences that we ignore at our peril. End of disclaimer. Normality doesn't equal mental health, the idea. At just as all scientific endeavors begin with a hypothesis, mental health science, a relatively young science, is still dependent on many hypotheses. Mental health diagnoses are mostly a label applied to a clustering of symptoms that assumes that these symptoms must have an underlying pathological etiology, a clearly defined cause or series of causes. This is a logical first step, but the assumption of a single defined cause, a biological dysfunction, or an inherited condition may be incorrect. In most cases, science has not clearly identified a causal pathology for mental disorders. Even the symptoms themselves can be misunderstood or subject to biases. Consider the following extreme illustration. Quote, in physical medicine, perhaps more ex extravagantly and outrageously in hindsight, we have seen diseases come and go, as in the case of physician Samuel Cartwright's 1851 discovery of dra drapetomania, the disease causing slaves to want to abscond, and dysynthesia aetiopis, aetiopsis, artiopsis? something like that, the disease causing slaves to destroy property. 
or going back a little further in time, of physician Benjamin Rush's 1792 discovery of negritude, the disease of being black. So a racist, slave-owning society saw the symptom of slaves revolting and then hypothesized a disease as the potential cause. Obviously, the symptoms were not symptoms and the disease didn't exist. Less sensational, but completely possible, is that we may be treating some mental distress where the symptoms are a perfectly healthy response to external conditions. Take, for instance, depression. Depression can be experienced as demoralization and sadness, but it only becomes a disorder based on the duration and or other variables. Observing these symptoms is sufficient to diagnose the disorder. Through practice, through research, and through pharmacology, there has been a set of treatments created that are shown to be somewhat effective in relieving some of the symptoms of depression, therapy, life adjustments, and drugs. Treatments have reduced some of the suffering and reduced some of the disability. But the issue is, scientifically, we cannot prove that depression is a disorder. We don't know exactly what causes depression. We don't know if all depression is caused by the same mechanism. And we don't know exactly with clarity what differentiates depression from normal, mentally healthy sadness. We can only say that having these symptoms differentiates sufferers from normal people, and the, these symptoms are serious, debilitating issues. If depression is a symptom but not a disorder, then treatment may actually be hiding the symptoms of something equally serious. This is exactly the point I'm trying to make in episodes number 13 and 15. There is some evidence that neoliberal capitalism may be causing some people's depression. So treating people with drugs doesn't deal with the cause of the suffering at all. It only gives the sufferer a bit of relief. This relief might be utterly temporary. Even more interesting, if our society is causing a significant number of people enough disturbance that they are debilitated, and if that number is constantly growing, and we have some research to say that it may be, then we are diagnosing the wrong thing. If a significant group of people cannot adapt and thrive in an environment that is unhealthy, are they ill? Maybe being depressed in our world is actually a healthy person's response to an unhealthy situation. Think of it like the proverbial canary in the coal mine. Miners in the past used to bring canaries with them into the mines because canaries are very sensitive to poisonous gases. So when carbon dioxide builds up or other lethal gases are present, the canaries would die and the miners would know to get out. Similarly, if our current normal lives were actually unhealthy, it makes sense that more sensitive people would be sickening first. Our way of identifying mental disorders and of treating them may actually be missing the point entirely. Growing depression rates in our society could indicate that something is deeply wrong with society and nothing is wrong with the depressed people at all. Stephen James Bartlett gives a few examples to illustrate this point. He shows how mental health researchers have concluded that having illusions, that is believing in things that are not true in reality, is generally regarded as normal and therefore healthy. Secondly, this normal group of people are not unhappy. They are able to function in the world and they can maintain satisfying relationships. Bartlett writes, quote, Despite the evidence provided by history of the human need for such beliefs, for a long time traditionally psych traditional psychology embraced the view that to be mentally healthy a person should be realistic, in touch with reality. That is, among other qualities, to be non-delusional about one's place in the world and about one can, what one can realistically expect from life. But in the past few decades, the pendulum has swung the other way, affirming that positive illusions play a central role in a healthy, satisfying life. Indeed, the propensity to hold positive illusions has now become tantamount to being psychologically normal and hence mentally healthy. A substantial amount of research testifies to the prevalence of illusion in the normal human condition. The healthy mind is a self-deceptive one. Departure from reality is not harmful. On the contrary, this finding allows us to presume that greater misinterpretations of reality are not associated with maladjustment 
and inflated self-deception is not synonymous with poor adaptation. So, if we develop delusions that help us to adapt to our world and don't harm us otherwise, then delusions are good and normal. Conclusion, delusions are healthy. But delusions can be distinctly bad. Take global warming. Many people believe that global warming is not happening, or that global warming is not a bad thing, or know that global warming is real and that it's bad, but continue to think someone, somewhere, is going to solve the problem and we can continue doing exactly what we've always done. Any of these illusions contribute to a general apathy and inaction. By failing to take global warming seriously and by failing to act, we actually are putting the human race in a destructive and possibly lethal situation. But someone might say, not all illusions are bad, only some are. That may be true. But how do we treat only bad illusions? How do we erase bad illusions without putting in place a treatment that removes both good and bad? Bartlett also talks about creativity and creative people. In general, creative people are more sensitive and unfortunately more likely to be diagnosed with a mental disorder or commit suicide. There's clearly a correlation. But what we don't know is the pathway of causation. Does creativity cause suffering or does suffering cause creativity? A question that has gotten some attention but isn't any better understood. We would all agree that human creativity is a good thing. It would not benefit the world to cure suffering if we also destroyed human creativity and expression. Remember the book A Brave New World? Maybe a healthier society would breed more creativity and we should be treating the less creative normals rather than treating the more creative abnormals. Finally, and most sensationally, Bartlett points out that modern psychology accepts human beings are susceptible to behaving violently and destructively. So the Holocaust in Germany was not met with a sizable resistance by normal Germans. Prison guards and police persons are known to need a lot of supervision because unsupervised, they have a tendency to become abusive to those they have power over. A mob is, under, is understood to quite frequently erupt into burning, looting, and destroying property or killing people. These things are accepted as being a part of normal behavior based on certain conditions. Yet, there are people who resisted the Holocaust. There are police and guards who aren't violent and who are likely to speak up about any abuses. And some members of mobs try to calm things or don't participate in the destruction. Who then is mentally healthy? the normal majority prone to bad behavior or the minority who are resistant. Wouldn't we consider that the non-violent and the non-destructive are actually better human beings? Wouldn't mental health be defined as people able to rationalize and resist these bad behaviors? Isn't normality the wrong standard? Maybe being normal is bad. So now what? Establish and test a new mental health definition. Bartlett suggests that we need to create a more objective description of mental health, one that incorporates a detailed study of outliers who behave in more admirable ways than the majority. That we study those who are able to use their intelligence and morals to, as a guide to resist becoming violent, hateful, and destructive. I have to agree with him. This is an idea with a lot of merit. Rather than psychology just being a study of the as-is, it also must become a study of the should-be. We need to stop confusing normality and conformity. It is probably time to discard the idea of normal and abnormal humans altogether. If you don't adapt to your society, that lack of adaptation doesn't need to be considered a pathology requiring treatment. Yet, we all intuitively know that if there were no adaptation of people to society, then we've also got a problem. You can't stuff billions of people on a small blue ball in space and let everyone do whatever they want. Our survival and our nature dictates some level of conformity. But it doesn't require a majority or more conforming to an all-encompassing normality. Conformity to our group's norms allows us to cooperate to achieve group goals that exceed any individual capability. But normality, meaning that we should copy and become like the majority of people, is the opposite. Normality means discarding parts of our individuality, choices, even in minor decisions. 
Fashion is a great example. Why do we insist that our bankers wear suits? Why would we want to promote it as a necessary part of our profession when it is so obviously a frivolous element? We do it because it's normal and it is what people expect because normal seems safe. But fashion isn't a healthy way to choose your banker. In fact, any ass with $1,000 can get a nice suit. It is irrelevant in any meaningful way. We are confusing the fact that bankers need to conform to a level of professionalism with them appearing like normal bankers. One is unrelated to the other. We need to start supporting outliers. The mental health profession is not making a mistake by identifying the weaknesses of normal human beings. It's not making an error by using commonly accepted normalcy as a comparison group. It is making an error by treating mental distress as something to be fixed in every instance. The profession is making a mistake if it moves from identifying deviation from the norms as a pathology that causes suffering. It is making a mistake when it quickly jumps from I want to help this person to the solution is to help this person adapt and succeed by being normal. It is a mistake to jump from this person is abnormal to let's fix him so that he can better fit and become a productive member of society. I would suggest that mental health practitioners should be helping normal people to accept a wider range of abnormality. This is already happening to an extent. For instance, dispensing with the mental disorder diagnosis of homosexuality and supporting the LGBTQ plus to accept themselves has allowed us to stop confusing necessary sexual conformity like consent, from an unnecessary normality. Straights only please, no homo. We know that our social groups drive normalization of beliefs. We instinctively will moderate our opinions in order to avoid facing confrontation with whatever group we are part of. We will also support group opinions out of solidarity. Even if we are able to maintain our independence of our thinking from our group's thinking, we will suffer from being repeatedly exposed to biased information. Groups will simply, simply emphasize facts that support their opinion and de-emphasize facts that do not. These tendencies in humans are probably inherent and unavoidable. But this is where the outlier is such a powerful example to develop the more robust and helpful definition of mental health. There are individuals who are able to maintain their objectivity in groups and there are those who seek to verify and potentially oppose group opinion. We need to understand, accept, and glorify the ability of some people to be passionate rebels. We need to learn to tolerate those who call us on our opinions, those who annoyingly are disagreeable. Why we need rebels? Our world is heading towards a rebellion. People join rebellions when they perceive injustice and extremes of disparity. If we don't change the current trajectory of our economic system, rebellion will become inevitable. We are in the midst of a massive relative redistribution of wealth from the middle class to the most wealthy, and this is driving growing frustration. These frustrations need a place to go. They need to be funneled into movements that can produce positive changes, even if these movements themselves are viewed as extreme, abnormal, and scary. I would point out that successful, peaceful rebellion is often led by extraordinary rebels. Galileo, Gandhi, Rosa Parks, and Reverend Desmond Tutu. Each of these rebels was absolutely and irredeemably abnormal. Rebellions that come without good leadership or an unwavering peaceful hand are often violent, out of control, and destructive. Rebellions unfortunately tend to incubate homicidal extremists. It is hard to claim, for instance, that Libya, Syria, Yugoslavia, or a very long list of other examples are better off after a popular, chaotic, and violent rebellion. I would argue that an open and violent rebellion is far more likely to drive a bad outcome outcome than other types of change, like mass social disobedience. So those of us prepared and intent on positive, peaceful rebellion need to begin making the change now. While civilized positive change is still possible, 
Once there's a battle in the streets, we all lose, and no one can predict the outcome. We are going to face extinction if we don't change. We can't continue as things are. Tesla and solar panels are not going to fix the total list of problems we're facing. The climate crisis might be averted if we can manage our energy needs without releasing as much carbon. But that just kicks the can down the road if we are still overproducing and overconsuming our resources. The climate crisis will be replaced by an environment collapsing due to pollution and waste. Even if we still have the climate to grow sufficient food, we will be facing agricultural crises from top soil erosion and stripping the soil of nutrients. We will still be facing the potential collapse of environmental si systems driven by species extinctions. The changes humanity needs to make are not a few well-placed tech innovations, but a complete revolution of how we value, use, and live together on our planet. Why rebels can save our lives. Rebels are a limited and highly critical resource. As David Miller writes in Psychology Today, quote, the rebel's superpower is challenge. Everything can be re-examined. There is no reason to stay with tradition or norm. Immense strength comes from taking a different position and challenging what everybody else views as normal. This gives the rebel the benefit of perspective and they see things in a way that no one else does. From this approach stems fabulous innovations, ideas, and products. New ways of thinking derive from challenging the status quo and not accepting the norm. This is the rebel's defining character trait and most valuable asset." Close quote. Dr. Nicola Davies, in an article for Natural Health, lists the strengths of rebels. She says they are exciting because they are most often very intelligent, enthusiastic, and tend to be promoted to leadership positions. They also build these capacities in others by being resistant and persistent in the face of opposition. So it seems clear that we need rebels if we believe the world needs to change, and it's hard to argue that it doesn't. Needing these outliers, these odd specimens, means we need to become more accepting of abnormal and encourage the weird. That means we are going to need to learn to tolerate people who will also probably challenge us in our views. It means that we are going to need to learn how to listen, even if we don't want to. It also means that we are going to need to learn how to integrate the abnormal, the deviant, and the weird into our communities. What do mental health professionals think of rebels? Too often they will pathologize them. They will see them as sad and defective. They see rebelliousness as a negative. Let me provide a few examples. Returning to Dr. Nicola Davies, she writes, quote, Adult rebels can be like obstinate children. No amount of punishment or scolding is going to decrease their rebelliousness, but instead is likely to intensify defiant behavior. Close quote. She adds, quote, Many, if not all, rebels are psychologically driven by a false sense of superiority or wo a wounded sense of powerlessness stemming from early childhood experiences. Their rebelliousness can be seen as a compensatory mechanism. If you understand this, it can help you feel compassion for the rebel. If you think you can sway a rebel easily with logical arguments, you need to think again. Hardcore rebels thrive off intellectual challenges and often has the mo have the most convincing viewpoints. Show the rebel that you respect their views even if you don't agree with them. This way you will help diffuse rather than intensify any defiant stance. When working with a rebel, give them space to express their own ideas and use concrete outcomes to show the rebel whether their ideas are good ones or not." Close quote. Once she has firmly clarified that rebels are really just wounded children, best to be treated with kind compassion and mollified with devaluing paternalism, she finishes her article with a section on how to restrain your own rebelliousness if you are also a defective and pitiable rebel. In an article for Psychology Today, Leon F. Seltzer writes, quote, because their defiance has been every bit as excessive and controlling as was their parents' criticism, they can remain unaware of the deeper hurts that compel them to aggressively act out in the first place. And tragically, these unhealed wounds can fester for the rest of their lives." Close quote. 
This may or may not be true of all rebels. I haven't been able to find any research that indicates that this is anything more than an anecdotal opinion based on Dr. Seltzer's patients. But I'm going to point out how these statements prejudice people towards rebellion and rebels. They aren't anyone to be admired but pitied because obviously they wouldn't behave this way if they weren't poor, mistreated children compensating for their damage. For the sake of argument, let's assume that Dr. Davies and Dr. Seltzer are correct. The rebels are not born but created from psychological damage in childhood. Even if rebels are abnormal, defective, or damaged, that doesn't make them any less effective. What is important is that rebels, for whatever reason, are able to see what others are not. What is important is that rebels are willing to enthusiastically champion change when others are not. Besides, if you have someone who instinctually rebels, how does it trying to force normalization on them help them? The rebel will only dig in deeper in opposition to that attempt. How about we actually value their differences and encourage their convictions? How about we honor their strengths, embrace them into our wider community because we need them? If we made them feel a part of our community and we made them feel appreciated and special because they are special, we would also give them a reason to act less destructively. We would give them a reason to care about the rest of us. We would slip under their defenses and allow healing if healing is needed. That we need rebels is pretty clear. If they also need us, perfect. Everyone wins. A conclusion. Who do we aspire to be? The lone Chinese student standing before the tank or the tank driver who said, why are you here? My city is in chaos because of you. Let not the rest of us, those who don't easily rebel, take inspiration. We know we need to change and yet we do nothing. Because it's hard, because our families won't understand, because we'd risk our career, because we would be labeled hippies, tree huggers, or fear mongers. Don't let fear of seeming weird keep us quiet and humble. Don't let fear of being criticized keep us from being healthy, being hopeful, being accepting, being inclusive, being resolute, and being a full, delightfully unique strange and flawed human being. So that was episode 18. Hope you enjoyed it. To be honest, I'm, I've got mixed feelings about this one. It, um, from a purely intellectual point of view, I think it's got huge holes in it. I mean, what is a rebel? And just because someone's a rebel doesn't mean necessarily they have anyone's best interest at heart or, or necessarily should be supported. On the other hand, from a purely resonant, emotionally resonant point of view, from, from how it feels when I watch it back, I think uh, it, it, you know, it, it, I'll stand by it. That's what I would say. I would stand by it. I think more than anything, it's a reaction to this this constant tendency, particularly online, to pull one another down, to critique uh, everybody. And sometimes I think critique's absolutely necessary. I don't think that's, that's, I don't think I want to say critiques are always bad, but on the, on the flip side, critiquing can get really excessive and sometimes I think ends up pulling apart really good ideas unnecessarily and ends up tearing down people unnecessarily and it also disrespects the fact that life's a journey and we all go through a, a sort of process and we deserve the support of our community particularly the, those people online who are really interested in, in living and creating a better world so in that on that particular point you know I really stand by what I've what I've had to say in in this video hope you enjoyed it Personally, I think I'm finally getting a little better at the editing part. It's a little bit more watchable. Regardless, whatever, this is XCG wishing all of you a speedy and happy trip down your road to freedom.